Hello and welcome to Hidden Histories. My name is Dr Bryce Evans, Senior Lecturer in History at Liverpool Hope University. In this series, we're going to be exploring the unconventional stories of Liverpool, the stories perhaps you haven't heard before of the past of this great city, people, places and time periods that perhaps you don't know about. So I'd like you to join me as we explore the hidden histories of this great city of Liverpool. Friday, in the evening, the landlady shouted up the stairs, Oh God, oh Jesus, oh sacred heart boy! There's two gentlemen here to see you. I knew by the screeches of her that these gentlemen were not calling to inquire after my health or to see if I'd had a good trip. So I grabbed my suitcase containing potassium chlorate, sulfuric acid, gelignite, detonators, electrical and ignition, and the rest of my Sinn Féin conjurer's outfit. I carried it to the window. Then the gentlemen arrived. A young one with a blonde Heron Volk head and a BBC accent shouted, I say, grab him, the bastard. So begins Brendan Behan's 1939 book, Borstal Boy. And we're here in Everton, in Liverpool, in that year, and Behan's mission to blow up the docks. Behan was on a self-appointed mission, but he was part of a bigger IRA campaign of 1939, which has largely been forgotten now. It's been forgotten because of the bombs of the Second World War, which took place shortly afterwards, and because of the modern troubles, which have obscured the 1939 bombing campaign in Britain. But in British cities, major British cities, more or less for every other day for the first nine months in 1939, there was an IRA bomb which went off. This program then tells the story of that hidden history, that history of IRA bombs here in 1939 in Liverpool and the surrounding area. Liverpool home to a huge Irish population, of course, suffered during that bombing campaign. This history has been all but forgotten, but this story is one of fear and loathing in the communities in Liverpool. Our story starts here in Crosby, in the north of the city. The IRA's bombing campaign of 1939 was the brainchild of a man called Jim O'Donovan. Now O'Donovan, as well as being an IRA man, was an electricity supply board worker. He was an electrician by trade. And so unlike the terrorism we're so used to today, where civilians are the target, O'Donovan drew up this plan whereby the IRA would take out economic infrastructure. So instead of killing civilians, he wanted the IRA to blow up pylons, electricity substations. This then, the IRA hoped, would plunge big British cities like Liverpool into darkness. With this happening on a regular basis, big cities like this suddenly having a blackout, the IRA hoped that it would force the British government to the negotiating table and that they, in turn, would give back Northern Ireland. At 5.48 a.m. in the early morning of the 16th of January, 1939, residents here in this street in Crosby were awoken by the sound of a large explosion and the shaking of their houses. Being early in the morning, people fumbled around, groped around, not knowing what was going on. You can imagine them coming out of their houses, scratching their heads in their pyjamas, asking each other, what was the big noise? What was the explosion? Nobody, it seems, knew. Now the very next day, the mystery of what caused the Crosby explosion was solved by two 15-year-old schoolboys. They were playing here in a field near the Leeds Liverpool Canal and they were playing near this pylon. At its base they found the remains of bombs and the remains of a little blue alarm clock. 
Now, why were the IRA blowing up pylons in the middle of nowhere? Remember that the plan was drawn up by an electrician, Jim O'Donovan. And this pylon here carried the main electricity transmission line for Liverpool, Warrington and Manchester on the one hand and Preston on the other. It might have been in the middle of nowhere in a field, but it was a well-chosen target. On the Ormskirk to Liverpool train, two windows smashed mysteriously here at Magull. These could only have been caused by bullets, it was claimed by shaken passengers, but none were ever discovered. These were not good times to be Irish on Merseyside. Here in what was the Picton Hall in 1939, there was a mass meeting to protest against the Irish in Liverpool. Now this is now the Children's Library underneath the Central Library in William Brown Street, but you have to imagine this place as it was at the time, a lecture theatre packed full of people, and they were here to listen to a city councillor, his name, David Rowan. Rowan was a long-term opponent of Irish migration into Liverpool. His idea was that the Irish were taking all the jobs and now had to be deported. So it was a raucous protest meeting at which Rowan demanded that Irish labourers be kicked out of Liverpool because gone from taking all the jobs in Liverpool, they were now starting to blow things up. Raucous meeting, a lot of people ejected, lots of cheers and jeers. But it illustrates that that long-term concern about Irish economic migration was now becoming a concern about security fears based around the Irish community. A fortnight later, and just as some of the hysteria surrounding the Liverpool pylon explosion had started to die down a little, Britain was rocked by news that the IRA had blown up the London Underground. The IRA targeted the tube at Leicester Square and Tottenham Court Road. These latest attacks on the tube indicated that the gear had shifted somewhat. Remember that this campaign was supposed to be all about targeting economic infrastructure, blowing up electricity pylons and the like. Now it seems civilians were the target. And it was in this atmosphere of national panic that the Liverpool authorities swooped on two suspects. They had reports that two men were occupying the same room at 41 Great Nelson Street in the Scotland Road area. Quite a queer proposition for the time. And so they swooped on their subjects and went in for the kill. So when the Liverpool police raided the house at 41 Great Nelson Street in the Scotland Road area, they found the two Irish men inside. They also searched the bedroom and in the bedside cabinet they found six electrical cable leads. These were potential bomb components and so it seemed that these two men were indeed IRA men bent on more explosions in Liverpool. As they were being arrested, one of the men made a sinister promise to the police. Something, he said, is going to happen in Liverpool tonight. And that evening, something did happen in Liverpool. The walls of this prison here, Walton Prison, were blown up by the IRA, who were attempting to spring out their comrades inside. Shortly thereafter, police raided Kelly's Tobacconists at 426 Edge Lane. There they found four kegs of potassium chloride. The Liverpool Echo reported that Kelly quote, stood calmly as the charges were read out to him when he appeared in court shortly thereafter. Kelly, who has long, waving hair, smiled faintly and occasionally raised his eyebrows as if surprised at something. As the solicitor read out the legal origins of the new charges, Kelly yawned. The Liverpool Echo's report tells us that intelligence gained at the Edge Lane seizure led police to a lockup in Lily Road, Wavertree, where large amounts of potassium chlorate iron oxide, sulfuric acid, gelignite, detonators and ammunition were found. But these fines and arrests in Liverpool did little to calm the atmosphere of panic. Instead, they jolted the city back into a state of nervousness. It wouldn't be long before a lot of men like Kelly, the tobacconist, were appearing in courtrooms like this up and down the country. Now, some of these men, of course, were guilty, but others were there because of this atmosphere of fear and panic. And that atmosphere in Liverpool is exemplified well by this so-called case of the mystery Irishman. In April 1939, the Liverpool Echo runs with this story of a mystery Irishman 
a young working class guy found in possession of 12 pounds. We might think that that's totally unremarkable, but this sum, so the police thought, was well beyond that of an ordinary working class Irish guy. And he was detained for a few months, uh, really on no charge. The case rumbled on, and so did the media panic that went with it. Another case was 400 people gathering at St. Mary's Church near Exchange Street. Why? Because rumours that an IRA arms dump had been found. It hadn't been. It was simply a priest, the local priest of the church, getting rid of some rusty old carbines from Boys Brigade practice because of the fear that they might fall into the hands of the IRA. Again, we get this atmosphere of fear and panic around the city. And it wasn't helped either by public actions. In March 1939, around about St. Patrick's Day, there were hundreds of prank calls by people claiming to be the IRA, claiming that they had let off bombs or were about to let off bombs around the city. So you can imagine back then, in that time, the fear. Was the Irish man up the road an IRA man? Were the IRA men living on your street? Where might the next bomb go off? And then, for all this atmosphere of anxiety about fake attacks, some real attacks did come. On the 26th of April 1939, bombs exploded across Liverpool. The first occurred at half past one in the morning in the old Bluecoat School. Woodwork was smashed, windows were smashed. A few hours later, Chad Burns Ship Telegraph Company, a big shop on Castle Street near the Liverpool headquarters of the Bank of England, was blown to bits. That shop was a prominent shop selling telescopes and surveying instruments, maritime instruments, that sort of thing. And as the morning wore on on the 26th of April into the early hours, more attacks came. Bombs started going off all around the place. In the True Form Shoe Company on London Road, a busy shoe shop, a bomb exploded. On a Hatters on Charlotte Street, a bomb went off. Incredible again that no one was killed in these explosions. And then finally, in the newspaper offices of the Liverpool Daily Post, their offices blown to bits. Bombs at this stage were going off across the city. Now, a week later, the 3rd of May 1939, the IRA launched its two most outrageous attacks of its 1939 bombing campaign in Liverpool, when the Paramount and Trocadero cinemas here in the centre of town, Camden Street, were attacked. Tear gas was let off in these crowded cinemas. You can imagine the scene as these cinemas full of kids, people slowly realised that they were choking on tear gas. Now, if we read the newspaper accounts and the witness reports of what happened, they describe the attacks as being carried out by a woman, a female IRA operative, described as a mysterious, attractive woman. A lot of the language is about this femme fatale, age 23, said witnesses, with a beautiful figure, long dark hair. Now, she may have been quite a sexy assailant, but these attacks on Camden Street caused widespread outrage. Three weeks later, and there was another cinema attack. It was carried out by the same Irish Republican femme fatale. In this latest cinema tear gas attack, 20 people required hospitalization after tear gas canisters were again released. Now, it wasn't just outrage that was elicited in Liverpool at these latest attacks. The tear gas attacks outraged public opinion across Britain. And soon, a couple of months later, in July 1939, Samuel Hoare, the Home Secretary, introduced the Prevention of Violence Act. It was a landmark piece of anti-terror legislation. It allowed the deportation of hundreds and hundreds of IRA suspects from large British cities, especially Liverpool. And it also required every Irish citizen living in Britain to register with police. Three days later, and the Liverpool Echo informed its readership that IRA terrorists, angered at the speed of the bill designed to smash them, staged three lightning outrages in the Liverpool district. Now these latest explosions in Liverpool, these three explosions, happened on the same day as a series of bombs in London. These bombs in London were attacks on railway stations which left 22 people wounded and one person dead. 
Hours later, in the Liverpool area, we had attacks on the Mount Pleasant post office, a pillar box on Ranley Street, and here in Magull, where this canal bridge was blown up. And when we read accounts of the explosion here in Magull, we hear about a courting couple who lingered in each other's arms and shared a kiss, walking away hand in hand, just minutes before the bridge was blown up and gone. On the same day, here in Magull, two electricity workers had a similarly lucky escape to our lovers on the canal bridge. The electricity workers were working on a pylon near here. At the base of the pylon, they found 78 sticks of gelignite. Now, it was a lucky escape again here in Magull for these electricity workers because the alarm clock attached to the explosives was due to detonate at 1 p.m. When they found it, it was 11 a.m. They escaped, really, with two hours to spare. Now, although many IRA activists were now being deported from Britain through the new terror legislation, attacks like the one at Magull, which we've just seen, proved that there were IRA men, IRA cells, still active. In Liverpool, outrage about those cinema tear gas attacks still persisted. And this manifested itself in a very ugly scene just days after the Magull bomb explosion. There was a matinee performance at the Burlington Cinema on Vauxhall Road, and a young Irishman, a 27-year-old guy called James Terry, who was a fitter, was watching the performance. People became alarmed when smoke and a flash were seen. All Terry was doing was lighting his cigarette, but people thought that he was trying to put a bomb together or a bomb had misfired. He was soon lynched by the mob. There were cries of, lynch the bastard, he's IRA. When the fire brigade were called to actually rescue him, an hour later, he was bloodied and beaten to a pulp. Now, by August 1939, just before the start of the Second World War, by August, the IRA campaign had become increasingly frenzied. And it was in August, late August, August the 25th, 1939, that the most notorious outrage of the IRA's bombing campaign occurred. That was in Coventry, when five people were killed by an explosion. But that outrage in Coventry, which is perhaps the most infamous and the most well-known uh, outrage of the IRA campaign of 1939, could well have occurred in Liverpool. That's because on that very day, Friday the 25th of August 1939, marked the start of eight explosions in Liverpool over the course of four days. And these explosions were masterminded by a pair of young lovers who would later appear in Liverpool in the dock together, charged with these crimes. On the 25th of August 1939, bombs laid by this couple exploded at Lloyds Bank, Victoria Street and on Stanley Street, both in the city centre. On Saturday the 26th of August, a further three bombs laid by the two people exploded. The most serious of these was an attack on a Red Cross first aid post on East Prescott Road. During this attack, a bomb in a tin can was thrown from a speeding car, releasing thick clouds of acrid green smoke. On Monday, the explosions began again, this time at the crowded Mill Lane railway station in West Derby. Wow, just look at this. Mill Lane railway station. Derelict now but you can imagine what this would have been like when it was a working railway station. Commuters on both sides, this is a big, a big station. And you can imagine what it would have been like as a bomb exploded. Passengers waiting to get their train and the sense of panic which must have set in. Really, looking at this railway station, a bomb going off here, you think it's incredible that no one was injured or killed. Now the final of this string of eight explosions in August 1939 occurred in a suburban house on East Prescott Road. This house had been rented by our Bonnie and Clyde couple of the Liverpool IRA and they appeared in court on the 18th of September 1939 under their real names, 
Vincent Crompton, age 36, and Jean Dobson, age 19. And the court heard how they'd moved to Liverpool and assumed the identities of Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Goodness knows, said the Director of Public Prosecutions, how many more explosions and deaths may have occurred if not for a slip by Dobson. Dobson, going by the identity of Mrs. Smith of Prescott Road, Rainhill, Liverpool, decided to make a break for freedom on the 29th of August. Smith, as she was known, set out for Holyhead to get the boat back to Ireland. However, she took the wrong train and ended up in Wigan Railway Station in the middle of the night. There, she was arrested by the railway police, who called the police at Liverpool, who called to the address given by Dobson. There, they found her accomplice, the 36-year-old man, Crompton, but after questioning him, left. Crompton, heartbroken that Dobson had abandoned him, had left him behind, left the house himself to head for Holyhead. Before leaving, however, he primed a massive bomb, which later exploded, destroying the house in Rainhill and leading to his arrest. Two months after the arrest of Dobson and Crompton and into an IRA campaign in Liverpool that had completely fizzled out, there came a 16-year-old Brendan Behan. And Brendan Behan, when he was arrested here, as we saw earlier, in Everton, and he spoke about his arrest, and he speaks about an anti-Irish mob that gathered and slung anti-Catholic and anti-Irish insults at him. However, Brendan Behan's actions as part of that IRA campaign and the hostility towards him captured that spirit of fear and loathing that the campaign had elicited. Tear gassing cinemas and tactics like that were never going to win the IRA favours or friends, especially uh, here in Liverpool. The IRA relied on wide-eyed young youths like Brendan Behan, who'd had only rudimentary explosives training, and threw them into cities like Liverpool. When we think about this campaign, the IRA's S plan, as it was called, which stood for sabotage, and we think about the original intentions to target economic infrastructure, electricity pylons, railways, canal bridges, but it deteriorated into something a lot more deadly. When we think about it in popular culture and popular memory, some people might be familiar with the song by the group The Dubliners, The Old Alarm Clock. It goes like this. When I first arrived in London in the year of 39, the city it was wonderful and the girls were so divine. But the police became suspicious and soon gave me a knock, charged me with the possession of an old alarm clock. The reference to the alarm clock speaks to the fact that IRA men active in Britain in 1939 were hanged, killed on the evidence of just possessing an alarm clock or sometimes a few electrical cable leads. When people think about bombs going off in British cities, they think, of course, about the Second World War. In the Irish context, they probably think about the troubles in the 70s and 80s and the IRA bombs of that period. And yet the 1939 campaign, as we've seen, uh, really wrought havoc, uh, havoc here in the streets of Liverpool. And it's been overshadowed and forgotten because of those bombs of the Second World War. And yet, as we've seen, it has that atmosphere of fear and loathing, of panic, paranoia and destruction that atmosphere, if you like, of a Graham Greene novel. And so it deserves to be remembered. The IRA's bombing campaign here in Liverpool in 1939 deserves to be remembered as yet another hidden history of this city.